You're watching CNBC TV 18. That's the first tick on the index, down about 60-odd points. Benchmark indices are down 0.8%. This is the third consecutive day that the markets have declined for us. The markets are under a lot of pressure. The Nifty, which is declining 160 points. Uh, there is Bank Nifty, which is the one which is putting some pressure. Got very, very close, within 1% of all-time highs, hesit hesitation, indecision, and finally some profit booking, some pullbacks is what we're seeing. 145 points, 150 points lower on the Nifty, 18,159. Uh, so the market did break through uh, Friday's lows and I think the next level is the 20-day uh, which comes in at about 18,070 or so. Okay, third day of a fall in the market. Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. You're watching Markets Today, the show where we track six hours of the day's trading action in five headlines. I'm Sonia Shanoi and here are all the headlines for the day. The stock markets fall for the third straight session. The Sensex falls over 500 points and the Nifty loses nearly 150 points. Broader markets outperform the benchmark indices. And the industry gives a thumbs up to the government's decision to scrap export duty on iron ore and several steel products. Minister Jyotir Aditya Sindhya says that removal of export duty will lead to a new era of growth for the steel industry. And RT Industries' 20-year near 8,000 crore supply pact with Deepak Fertilizers results in a win-win. While RHI Magnistita's proposed acquisition of Dalmia Group's refractories business lifts the stock. And weak demand outlook for China, a healthy stock position in Europe and slowing US growth drags oil prices lower, even as expectations of an output cut at OPEX meet on December 4th rises. In stocks and news, HUL gains after positive outlook from its analyst meet and brokerage upgrades. Zomato falls after its co-founder resigns. Escort zooms ahead on the positive growth outlook. And here's the lineup of what we have in store for you. It's a packed show today. In market opinion, we have Andrew Holland, the Chief Executive Officer of Avendis Alternate Strategies. In corporate voices, we have TV Narendra, the MD and CEO of Tata Steel, uh, with a comment on steel consumption and government's infrastructure push. Well, straight to the day's market action then, the Lal Street saw red for the third straight session amidst growth concerns. The Nifty and the Sensex fell close to a percent, with the Nifty ending below the 18,200 mark. Broader markets fared better but ended mildly lower. In fact, all in all, you'd have to say the market was under pressure because of global queues and we're still uh, short of that all-time highs with the Nifty seeing resistance at the 18,400 mark. Prashant Nair is here with a wrap of the day's trading action. Prashant. The market did come off today. It was looking like it will for the last many sessions and today we lost about 0.8% in the Nifty. Uh, the banks did better and largely because of PSU banks and I'll come to that in a bit. Large losses in IT services, real estate and energy as a pack. Energy, of course, because oil prices have come off. The exceptions, as I said, were PSU banks, uh, which were up. I'll come to names in a bit. And you also had small caps, although broader market breadth was negative. Small caps uh, did better. Uh, ONGC was a top loser with, of course, direct correlation with what's happening with oil prices, which are going down. Adani Ports, Indalco, TCS, etc. A few other heavyweights which were down. Only three names with gains in excess of 1% of the Nifty, BPCL, Bharti and Axis Bank. There were two listings, uh, interesting price action. One opened sharply lower but ended higher. Both actually by close were higher in trade. One a chemical company, the other an NBFC. Broader market cuts coming through in Zomato and Nika, which continue to go down. Uh, defense names are seeing pullback, so uh, Mazgao and Kochi Shipyard, both lower. Uh, Adani Green, Lodha and Kim's Hospital Chain were some of the other cuts uh, today. Gains coming through in S Escorts, the company held the analyst day. Markets like what they heard. IEX, Godavari Power, Yuko Bank Central and IOB from the PSU Bank space doing pretty well. Are we starting to see some pullbacks in global uh, risk on moves as well? And I think that's the relevant question here. For the Nifty, the 20-day, which is about 60, 70 points away from where we closed yesterday, uh, becomes important, a level which bulls must defend if buying has to come back in the near future once again. Okay, so that's on the market and how it fared at close. Remember, 18,400 has become a bit of a hurdle for the market. So we're just short of those all-time highs because of the global queues and the kind of pressure that we're seeing over there. In that context, in fact, we have some commentary coming in from Andrew Hall and the CEO at Avendis Alternate Strategies who said that emerging markets will be the place to find growth going forward. He also discussed his sectoral bets in the Indian markets. Listen in. You know, emerging markets will be the uh, you know the place to to, to find growth and and, uh, and and a pickup in in, in the 
global economy. Not obviously not initially, but uh, that's how the market will play it. Uh, but isn't that interestingly, you know, whilst everyone's talking about emerging markets, I think the the overweights are going to be more of the the, the exporting type countries like uh, Korea, China. Uh, which is obviously, you know, we've seen some some kind of pick up there uh, from the very low levels. And I still like the banking sector and the auto sector. I mean, they might have those kind of uh, pullbacks, but those are the times when you should be buying into it. Uh, but I think the themes could continue to remain defense, renewables, and then the, the kind of corporate capex cycle uh, into those, um, you know, uh, those industries where the supply chain has been difficult uh, going forward. So semiconductors is one, electronics will be the other. Um, so these are the new kind of themes which I think will play out in uh, 2023. So the valuations, some of these sectors still remain high, uh, but I think you have to be very selective and, you know, who's going to be the beneficiary? We talked about this before, like if it's a capex cycle, it's all right, uh, that's the word coming in from Andrew Holland. But we also had a chance to speak to Mark Matthews of Bank Julius Bay and Company, who continues to remain overweight on the Indian markets. He said that India will be insulated if there is a recession in the US. So he was quite optimistic despite the global challenges. Take a look. We are already overweight India. We've been so for well over a year, and we would like to remain so. The chances of a recession in America are high next year. Uh, we put the chance at about 40 percent right now of a recession happening in america but i suppose that the markets have already priced that in because as i said they have underperformed so much this year anyway um on balance uh, we still stick with india because it's not a proxy for the global economy it's a proxy for its own economy and uh, its own economy is doing well and we think it will continue to for a few more years so despite the fact that it's expensive relative to the others, uh, we're very happy uh, keeping our overweight there. I think it would be quite well insulated. And the reason I say that is uh, there's two things. The first is that foreign investors, as you would know, have not uh, built up substantial overweight positions in India. Uh, quite the converse, actually. And so that's a big difference between today in 2008. 2008, India, of course, uh, went down a lot. Uh, but that's because foreigners had been buying it up for the last few years. And the second thing is, unlike 2008, if we do have a recession in the United States next year, I think it'll be a very shallow one. Okay, on to the second headline now. CNBC TV18's news break is now confirmed. The government has withdrawn export duties on most steel and iron ore products that were levied in May this year. The steel ministry says that the rollback decision was taken on the back of a steep fall in steel exports in October. Nigel is here with more on that. Nigel. Well, that's right. The export duties that were levied in May 2022, they have been rolled back. So on steel, stainless steel, pellets, as well as iron ore with FE content of less than 58%, it's been brought down to zero. On iron ore with FE content of more than 58%, it's been brought down from around 50% to around 30%. And they've reintroduced the import duty on coking coal. Why did they do this? Why is the reason for the pullback? Well, the key reason was to bring down prices. And that's been achieved, partly achieved. The second factor is demand has been dwindling because there's no export you know, a window that's open to some of these producers. So demand has been dwindling, inventories have been going up as well. And some point of time, it may cause them to pull back their capex that they have already laid out. And finally, the trade deficit number has been you know, a little on the higher side. So maybe this provides some bit of a cushion. Focusing on individual stocks and sectors, well, for steel companies itself, the, t the key uh, beneficiary uh, of these would be JSPL, JSW Steel, Tata Steel, as well as Sale. How do they benefit? Well, they can re-export if they need to. However, on the pricing front, it doesn't provide them any kind of cushion because domestic prices are at a premium in comparison to international prices. Moving to the stainless steel players, well, they gain. Europe as it is, is grappling with the energy crisis, so they have an opportunity to export, and they can restart that with the removal of this export duty. Remember for JSL stainless, well, they were exporting close to 25 to 30% of their volumes, which came down to around 5%. Pellet producers, particularly Godavari Par and Ispat, they were exporting close to 70% of their total production. They can restart that. 
And finally, NMDC, though they don't export uh, iron ore, but with pellet prices moving up, it'll give a bit of a base or some bit of a fillip to iron ore prices as well. What are brokerages making of it? Well, Jeffries, they say that this is unlikely to provide any support to the steel prices. So they have their neutral rating, a hold rating on Tata Steel, as well as an underweight rating on JSW Steel. Philip Capital, they say that this is a positive, but from the medium to the long term. In the near term, it's not much of a catalyst. And ICICI Securities as well, they perceive the rollback of export duties as a valuation re-rating event, not an earnings upgrade trigger. So put all this together. That was the big news today. All right, that's on the steel sector. The industry, meanwhile, has given a thumbs up to the government's decision to scrap export duty on steel and iron ore. Danish Anand gets us the feedback from the steel industry. As the economy is bouncing back from the pain imposed by COVID, the government last week gave a major relief to the steel sector by removing export duty on certain items. Well, this had been a long-standing demand of the industry and the government feels that this will lead to a new era for India's steel sector. Well, this is what the major industrialists from the steel sector had to say. We expect this demand and requirement to continue. But is there any concerns for the future? Yes, it's absolute yes. We have to be vigilant about the changing expectations from the steel industry. As the country marches forward in the in infrastructural growth. Winter time generally for European countries, US countries, export market if I can say, is generally at a slowdown pace because they're looking at uh, uh, destocking mode. Uh, but we feel after January onwards again, the export market should pick up. So very lastly, what are your expectations from the upcoming budget? Is there a particular wish list that you have in mind? So uh, one thing was definitely the removal of export duty. The other request would be that any kind of dumping that is happening in the country which relates to steel, stainless steel, that should again be looked at by the government in a favorable manner and take some action according to that. I would say over the last uh, six months, demand in steel in India has held up actually the steel industry while exports was not there. The uh, international demand has been impacted, one because of the pandemic followed by the war and the high energy cost as a consequence of the pandemic and the war is resulting into some deacceleration in the demand in many parts of the world. But we expect that to be sorted out probably as we go along to the next year. While the industry is happy with the latest government announcement, but still there are many challenges in the future as currently the international demand is low and it is majorly the domestic demand which is keeping the steel industry running. The industry expects certain announcements from the government in the upcoming union budget and the industry feels that there should be some announcement on anti-dumping of stainless steel, there should be some announcement on demand generation and they are seeking a clarity on green steel decarbonization and how the government will help the industry in energy transition. With video journalist Rajinder Singh Raina, this is Danish Anand for CNBC TV 18. Okay, that's on the steel sector, but let's move on to the third headline today. RT Industries and Deepak Fertilizers were up by over 2 and 7 percent in trade today. This after RT Industries, the largest consumer of nitric acid in India, and Deepak Fertilizers, the largest producer of nitric acid in Southeast Asia, signed a 20-year agreement for the supply of nitric acid. Now, what does this mean for both companies? Sonal Bhutra is here with the details. Sonal, over to you. Yes, RT Industries is in focus, so is Deepak Fertilizers. Both these companies have entered into a 20-year binding agreement and this is for Deepak Fertilizers to supply nitric acid to RT Industries. In terms of more details about this, this, is, uh, this term sheet is to be executed by end of calendar year 2022 and the total cost here or the total size of the contract is around 8,000 crore rupees. Now, to give you some perspective, RT Industries is one of the biggest users of nitric acid and for Deepak Fertilizers, it is one of their biggest product as well. Uh, they already had an agreement in place which is getting expired on 1st of April and that's why the renewal of that contract but tenure this time is much longer close to 20 years versus 3 to 4 years earlier. Aarti Industries was already planning to set up a nitric acid plant in order to ensure that there is backward integration and secure their raw material supplies as well but now they won't be going ahead with it and they did mention how availability of nitric acid will continue to become a big issue for the company and now they have secured this so that is really the impact. Uh, the agreement secures supply of nitric acid, which is a big raw material for the company. We spoke to the company earlier in the morning and they did mention that they now will not be putting up that nitric acid plant uh, that they had earlier planned. 
The investment in the nitric acid plant was expected between 150 to 200 crore rupees. The overall cost could be around 800 to 1000 crore rupees. But now that they're not going ahead with it, it will free up the capital for RT Industries and that of course is a big positive. And this contract according to the company will also enable volume stability and price and comfort as well. And that's why they are quite positive on this particular contract that they have entered into with Deepak Fertilizers. In view of overall growing nitric acid demand, you know, we had to put our own plant. We had already announced uh, putting up a concentration plant in the uh, month of April. And we are just evaluating whether we put our own uh, WNA plant. Uh, that's where this uh, long-term contract uh, discussion uh, started. We will not be putting up that plant now once we have this uh, contract in place. Okay, they're not setting, uh, planning to set up a plant right now because the contract is in place. Meanwhile, RHI Magnesita surged by over 10% in trade today after it acquired 100% stake in Dalmia Bharat Refractories. The company's management told CNBC TV18 post the acquisition the debt will be at 1300 crore rupees and it has plans to spend 200 crore rupees of capex. Listen in. Around 100 crores, and with this debt, it will be around 1300 crores. But still, I believe um, it will not have a serious impact on my debt. That equity ratio will still remain uh, one is to one or so. Kept 200 crores uh, roughly for a modernization of uh, Dalmia Bharat refractory. But it will be spent in next uh, four or five years' time. Okay, let's take a quick commercial break on that note, but do stay tuned in. We'll be back in just moments from now with all the other top headlines of the day. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Markets Today on CNBC TV 18. Let's go to the rest of the headlines that we're tracking for you. A big headline globally was that oil prices fell after a weak outlook, uh, demand outlook for China, a healthy stock position in Europe and slowing U.S. growth. The fall in oil prices saw stocks like ONGC and Oil India fall between 4 and 2 percent. Manisha Gupta is here with the details. Manisha. Oh, well, yes, it has been a weak bearish uh, crude oil prices down 10% in the previous week and down 3% a uh, week prior to that. So we are trading at a two-month lows right now. And in the last one month as well, the crude prices have turned negative by nearly 6%. It has to do with the strength in U.S. dollar, weak China demand. China actually has told uh, Saudi Arabia to load lesser volumes to China by nearly 40 to 50%. And that tells you that the demand is weak in China. Europe as well has stopped Stocked up enough uh, crude and natural gas preparing for the winter months. So that concern also has eased off. And it's not just about China and Europe. The U.S. manufacturing activity, the lowest since 2011, also is weighing on crude oil prices. What the markets are now watching out for is the OPEC and Allies meeting on 4th of December and the expectation that the European Union and G7 will put a price cap on Europe oil on 5th of December. So those two dates are going to be quite important ahead of the 14 December US Fed meeting. So crude prices can continue to be slightly more bearish from here on. Okay, Manisha, thanks for that. Well, the fifth headline today, Hindustan Unilever gained in trade on the back of positive commentary from the company's first analyst meet that took place in the last three years. This was the first physical analyst meet that HUL had. Mangalam Malu joins in with the key takeaways. Mangalam, over to you. Well, HUL did well in today's trading session, and that's after the company held its first analyst day in the last three years. And it did uh, speak more of the same and also outlined the growth strategy that the company has. The biggest takeaways were the fact that they're leaders in eight, over 85% of the categories that they operate in. At the same time, you know, they've reached almost 9 million stores. 25% of their demand is generated digitally at the same time. 33% of their products are premium in nature in terms of their sales. The company has developed a lot of uh, uh, markets as well as marketing development sales, which now contribute to over 10,000 crores of their revenue. And they have over 16 plus brands, which are over 1,000 crores in terms of uh, sales. Importantly, a lot of their verticals are doing extremely well, namely hair care. We have the health food drinks, which has increased in penetration as well as physical reach. And we've seen some growth come by in the liquid wash, ultra premium liquid wash category as well. Brokerages were happy with that. We had Jeffrey say that, you know, it is an execution powerhouse and uh, they expect some gross margin improvement going forward as well. They have a target price upwards of 3,000 on the stock. Uh, 
We did see Philip Capital as well maintain their high conviction buy on the stock at the target price upwards of 3200 odd rupees. Whereas ICICI Direct says that premiumization is the name of the game. They too have a target price of 2800 on this stock. All right, thanks a lot, Mangalam, for that. But Zomato was the other stock that we want to talk to you about. It fell by over 4% after the resignation of its co-founder, Mohit Gupta. In fact, the company has seen a slew of exits recently. What's happening here? You know, there have been three large exits in the last one month itself. And the latest one came on Friday, where the co-founder, Mohit Gupta, has announced his departure. The recent exits include the likes of Rahul Ganju, who's the head of new initiatives. You had Siddharth Jawar as well, who's the head of Intercity Legends, uh, uh, you know, resigning just a few weeks ago. On the same, we had Jeffries Wright on this. They said that going by the release, it does not appear that they are actually looking for a successor to Mohit Gupta. And in their interactions, they found that Deepinder Goel itself, uh, himself was in control of the business. So they do not see any big disruption in or major change in the strategy of the company. And with these departures, now it is clear Zomato's leadership is three-pronged right now. Uh, Deepinder Goel will lead their food delivery business and oversee the other two businesses. The other two businesses being Blinkit, which is head by Albinder uh, Dinsa, as well as Hyperpure, which is uh, currently led by Rakesh Ranjan. So, no real problems. They are positive on the stock, but in the near term, they believe it would be range-bound, primarily because the company traverses through the growth versus profitability path going forward. So, they will revise their call only after the third quarter numbers. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, the other stock that moved today was Escorts Kubota. It ended the day over 7% higher after the company released its midterm business plan guidance. In fact, 8.5% by the end of trade. And now uh, the company is very optimistic. They expect revenues to more than double uh, by FY28 over FY22. They also talk about how the EBITDA margins will improve to mid-teens versus 10.8% in FY22. And they're looking to grow their market share both in the export as well as in the domestic business. Remember, in the domestic business, they have a little over 10% market share and they're looking to grow that in a big way. Now, how do they plan to do this? Uh, they are going to uh, increase their production. So their capacity is going to be expanded from 170,000 currently to all the way to 300,000 and they're putting in a big chunk of money for this capex plan they have about 4000 crores outlined for this so that's a massive plan that they have but most brokerages believe that a lot of it could be in the price because the stock has rallied significantly jp morgan maintains an underweight they say that yes this is positive news but the stock is also uh, pricing that in it's trading at over 25 times fy24 so pricing in both the good news and the strong growth but the other stock in focus today was iex it was up by over four percent in trade after news that the company is considering a buyback and there's a board meeting on the 25th of november to decide that uh, vivek my colleague is here with the details vivek over to you well, that's right so when you're talking about iex you know after quite a while you're actually seeing so the management has decided to opt for a buyback. Uh, uh, just delving a little deeper into you know what exactly the company has as far as its resources are concerned, the total cash on the books is close to 1,000 crores. This includes the investment in mutual funds plus the cash component and estimated free cash is in the range of 500 crores. Now, this particular stock in the last year has been quite a bit uh, of a big underperformer. The stock is down almost 44% and stock is just trading marginally higher when you're looking at its 52-week low of close to 134 rupees. Now, looking at the stock and the reasons for its underperformance, uh, one of the main reasons why the valuation multiples have derated has been the fact that the company that earlier enjoyed a near monopolistic status as far as uh, power exchange, uh, near-term power trading exchange market in India was concerned, has seen the onset of two newcomers, two competing exchanges, and this has led to valuation multiples getting derated. Also, the company also has said that the trailing volume has seen a bit of softness on the back of price cap that was introduced as far as the power market itself was concerned. So sellers too have stayed away. But going forward, you know, the analysts have highlighted that there are a couple of incremental opportunities that can be significant triggers. The first one is the introduction of long duration contracts. And the second is the introduction and the operational efficiencies that the, you know, analysts expect to see from the Indian gas exchange in which IX has a significant stake. Okay, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Markets Today. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a great evening.